Hey everybody, Brian Newber here from goldenblack.com live once again at home. It is uh, Tuesday. Yeah, Tuesday. Um, pardon the whipping winds outside, kind of scary. Um, anyway, uh, this is your goldenblack.com daily quarantine uh, simulcast for Tuesday. If you're new to the show, once again, we're just doing a, a, a little conversation every day. Um, about Purdue uh, of some kind. Uh, the bottom of the barrel is pretty close to being scratched here uh, for topics, but we will do the best we can with this. What we're doing is we're, we're just doing this. We're posting it on YouTube. We're posting on social media, goldenblack.com, just to have some level of engagement with you each day. Um, much to your chagrin in some cases, I'm quite certain. We're also posting it as a podcast on our, on our, our Golden Black Radio platform. Uh, I've been remiss all along in reminding you on YouTube or our podcast platform at Golden Black Radio to make sure you subscribe so you get all this stuff as soon as it comes across. I'm sure you're all sitting on the edges of your seat every day waiting for something to come across. Um, I'm, of course, being sarcastic. Uh, but here it is, your Tuesday, goldenblack.com, uh, daily quarantine brought to you by our sponsors, Fox Purdue Bookstores, Purdue Federal Credit Union, Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, First Source Bank, East End Grill, and the Charters Team Remaxability Plus. Yes, I do have to count them off on my fingers uh, because there are a lot of them. Also want to remind you once again, of course, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant in Lafayette, as well as our longtime friends at Arnie's and Bruno's, not Bruni's as I called them last week, as well as the Whitaker Inn in West Lafayette uh, remain open for care orders um, during quarantine. So if you're looking for damn good food or just want to support our local businesses, Sixth Street Dive Restaurant Lafayette, Arnie's literally all over the place, Bruno's in West Lafayette, and the Whitaker Inn in West Lafayette. Keep them in mind, please. Uh, we implore you. Today's topic, um, I know we've talked about this on a variety of platforms, but need something to talk about. After Matt Harms graduated uh, and transferred uh, last week from Purdue, that left Purdue with an open scholarship uh, for next season, thus turning Purdue's eyes toward every recruiting reporter's nightmare, the graduate transfer wire. Uh, Purdue will look for help uh, on a one-year basis with that one scholarship to fill. Um, so I just wanted to kind of break down that scene a little bit for you and hopefully uh, throw a big bucket of cold water on all of your hopes and ambitions about Purdue going out and finding the guy who's going to be the missing piece to a Final Four team next year because... Don't get your hopes up. Here's the deal. Uh, I think we've laid this out pretty good on a variety of platforms, but I figured I'd elaborate here. Purdue can only take a one-year player. Only, only, only. Because you cannot compromise the 2021 recruiting class. As of right now, you only have one scholarship left for that class. A multi-year player would take that scholarship. You would essentially then have a one-man recruiting class unless you oversign and take two. That's not going to happen. They're going to try to take two, might even take three. Uh, but you're not going to burn that scholarship on a multi-year player now. That narrows the field considerably because that rules out all multi-year graduate transfers and that, that rules out all sit-one-to-play-one type of guys. This has to be a one-year, immediately eligible graduate transfer. I know that's... Most of them are that way, but not all of them. And when you're three weeks late to the to the transfer recruiting party like Purdue is, uh, a narrow field is not ideal. It is not optimal, uh, shall we say. That is the landscape here. Purdue is perilously late to the transfer recruiting scene, which is challenging and daunting and dog-eat-dog -dog enough. And... It is funny when the transfer wire first opens up, all of a sudden everybody's already got a list. You know why that is? Because they, they're already thinking about where they want to go. In some cases, schools are taking some liberties uh, with some, you know, rules and and tampering with guys. I don't, I'm not saying that's necessarily widespread, but it does happen. Um, so Purdue is not only early to the party like a lot of people were, they are perilously late uh, to this party, needing to find needing a lot of things to come together for them to find the right guy. The other part of this is if that's not enough, being late to the party and needing only a one-year, only being able to take an immediately eligible one-year guy is the fact that Purdue, unless you're recruiting a really high-level forward who can maybe play forward and uh, center, you really can't tell them, hey, you have a golden opportunity here to come in and start because 
if you're recruiting a center and replacing a center with a center, uh, you know, does in fact stand to reason. Um, Travion Williams obviously is a very good player, uh, a player who can be very, very, very good, if not great, um, if a few things fall into place for him. Obviously a player Purdue is extremely invested in. Uh, Purdue is not going to go out and tell a center transfer it's an open competition or we need you to start over this guy. That's just not going to happen. And adding to that is the fact that Painter obviously recruits a certain way, as uh, we've well documented on our site at times, that he's not going to he's not going to bring in a guy with he's not going to inflate someone's expectations walking the door and then run the risk of that player being bitter when he's here and thinking he was lied to or thinking he was misled, whatever it may be, he is going to tell him pretty straight what the deal is uh, in terms of if it's a center, hey, you are here to push Trayvon Williams, you're here to back up Trayvon Williams. If it's a forward, you can say, hey, look, we have a pretty we have a pretty open mix here, um, and you are going to have an opportunity to earn whatever you get. Um, I, I do think the forward position is in uh, a state of transition, obviously, uh, you know, I personally think they're going to use Nogel Eastern more there um, than they ever have. I'm talking about the four, the, the quote unquote power forward position, really the only forward position. Uh, I do, I personally think Purdue will use Nogel Eastern more at the four than they ever have. Uh, obviously Aaron Wheeler is going to have an opportunity to show that this season was a fluke instead of his new reality. Uh, obviously, he struggled profoundly as a sophomore. I don't think anyone's going to give up on him. I think if he has a great offseason and perhaps takes some lessons out of his sophomore year, there's no reason to think he can't get right back on track in terms of being a very, very good college player. Um, Mason Gillis obviously comes out of redshirt. I know Purdue uh, really, really likes Mason Gillis. He will play uh, no matter what, whether he's ready to be that guy who is the starter, who is the guy you really lean on in that position. I don't know yet. Nobody does. Uh, and nobody's going to have much of an opportunity this off season, uh, to see it because there may not necessarily be an off season in a traditional sense. Uh, so Purdue has some pieces at that forward position. What they don't have is that obvious guy coming back who is the guy at that position. So if you recruit a forward off the graduate transfer wire, you can at least say, Hey, you know, there's a good chance you'll have just as good a chance as anybody because we have one guy who really struggled last year, one guy who's been a guard his whole career, and one guy who um, hasn't played a game yet. So you can make a credible argument there that you could offer some playing time, you can offer some real opportunity there, and if it's a guy who could play the five also, that might be the best promise you can make. Um, but the thing about the graduate transfer wire, these guys are moving up, these guys, a lot of them, you know, want to play at a really high level. They want to play a lot at a really high level. They need a certain measure of guarantee. They need to find the best situation for themselves, whether they're just trying to win a lot of games, whether they're trying to set themselves up for a professional career, whether it be in the NBA or overseas, uh, whichever avenue they might be having their eyes on. It's all about them. And that's fine. That's what they've earned. That's why they got their degree. That's why they're taking advantage of the graduate transfer rule. It's all about them. So you have to speak to that when you recruit them. And when you can't credibly make certain arguments, certain promises, it's really, really difficult. That is the situation Purdue's in. A, they're three weeks late to the party. B, they can only take a one-year player who's immediately eligible and then out the door in a couple months. And C, they can't do it promising anything, nor would they necessarily anyway, given the way Painter tries to recruit and team build. So that's kind of where Purdue is right now. I know there's a bunch of names people see just because they're, they're on the lists of the top graduate transfers out there. Uh, those guys already have their lists of like 10 or whatever, and Purdue's not going to be on that list. Uh, there are some guys too I know Purdue's reached out to, found out, hey, I need to know I'm a starter. And that's just not happening. Uh, it's just not happening. There's some other guys out there that people might pay attention to who turn out, actually have two years of eligibility or – they have to sit, sit one to play one. Both of those guys are ruled out under those circumstances. So this is a really narrow field uh, Purdue has to work with uh, to recruit a graduate transfer uh, to add to next year's team. Um, if you ask me right now what I think would happen, I will tell you this. Matt Painter is a minimalist by nature as a coach. 
He does not want guys at the end of his bench who are unhappy with their playing time, who might be distractions, who might affect team chemistry. We have seen that time and again. Um, him trying to avoid such things, whether it be by redshirting guys, whether it be by not using every scholarship he has at, at his disposal in the spring, just to take guys to take guys and then run them off if you don't want them like a lot of, uh, a lot of college programs do. Um, my guess here is that he is not just going to add anybody. The perfect scenario is going to have to fall in his lap here for him to do this, largely also because of the circumstance of this offseason. He is at no point in time this summer going to be able to sit across a table, most likely, from this player he's recruiting to have an actual conversation. If all of this is done in June, if June opens up as normal, it is entirely possible then you could bring in graduate transfers for visits. But if a kid doesn't know where he's going by June, you know, the there's a good chance that's not necessarily going to happen either. Uh, just a, a, a very difficult set of circumstances for both sides of the transfer wire this year. The schools are in a very tough spot, but the kids are in an even tougher spot. They have to pick their schools basically this spring without the opportunity really to take visits, presumably, unless something dramatic changes here. But Painter, probably as much as any coach in the country, if not more so, values relationship that values knowing exactly what he's getting into with these guys. He needs to bring them to campus, get to know them, spend time with their family, spend time with the people around them, get to know them, vet them as closely as he can. Historically, every time he's recruited a transfer, he by himself has traveled in the spring to go meet with that player at Starbucks, McDonald's, whatever it might be. I don't know if there's ever been a McDonald's meeting, but I knew to, I do know Starbucks has been a frequent locale for him meeting one-on-one -on -one with players who are prospective transfers. So that's kind of where things are right now. Painter's not going to get much of a chance to be around these guys. These guys aren't going to probably have a chance to get to campus before they have to make their decisions. My guess is Painter would be most inclined to err on the side of caution there and then just play it out and hope in terms of your backup minutes at the five, hope you can get enough out of Zach Eady, hope you can get enough out of Emmanuel Dewona, maybe run some smaller lineups, get creative to kind of overcome whatever issues you might have with your backup center position. Um, Cause the important part of that is that Trayvon Williams, as good as Trayvon Williams can be, probably is never going to be a 30 minute a game player. So there's always going to be at least 10 minutes there where you have to kind of piecemeal things together. Purdue just may have to make do with what it has. Um, you would like to be able to order off a menu every off season and say, Hey, here's what we need punch in the right buttons after you put your put your dollar in. It's a horrible example, uh, a horrible analogy for college basketball recruiting, but it's the best I could come up with. Put, put your money in the machine, hit the right buttons, and exactly what you need comes out. It doesn't work that way. Um, and this year, more than ever, Purdue has all sorts of obstacles in its way on the graduate transfer wire. So it is going to be really hard-pressed to find what it needs. It is going to be just as hard-pressed to even know what it gets is what it needs because the familiarity process in this is going to be horribly, horribly stunted. And that is a huge problem as much as any uh, of the other pro problems I've detailed here. So my point here, don't get your hopes up. Don't think that um, some transformative player uh, is walking through the door here who, again, is going to be the final piece of a Final Four team or something like that. If Purdue can get a good kind of ditch digger guy, a, a guy who just wants to be part of something big, who just wants to win, something like that, <clears throat> who's happy to be a role player, happy to be potentially a backup, happy to just play a role. If you can find that guy in the graduate transfer wire, hey, awesome. But he's got to be a one-year guy. Um, he can't have unrealistic expectations. And um, it all has to take, it all has to come together at a very, a very late juncture of the game. And again, there's just a lot of things that have to fall into place here. So my message to all of you is don't get your hopes up. That's why I got our, that's our, our daily, um, our goldenblack.com daily quarantine, dashing all of your excitement for this off season. So you're welcome. Um, this has been brought to you by our friends at Fox Purdue bookstores, Purdue federal credit union, the six street dive restaurant, first source bank, East end grill, and the charters team remax ability plus want to remind you once again, um, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant in Lafayette remains open for carry out orders, as do our friends at, at Arnie's and Bruno's, as well as the Whitaker Inn in West Lafayette. So if you're looking for damn good food or just to support our local business in these trying times, please keep them in mind. Uh, the Sixth Street Dive Restaurant, First Source Bank.
Arnie's Bruno's. First Source Bank does not have food. Please don't call them ordering a pizza. Arnie's Bruno's and the Whitaker Inn. So thanks a lot, everybody. We'll talk to you again uh, tomorrow. Have a good one.